Talk Climate, I'm Brian McGuire. Engaging all EU citizens in the climate discussion, that's our theme today. And we're supported by the European Institute of Innovation and Technology, Climate Kick. So thank you uh, for that and thank you for joining us today. Climate science and technology are complex topics with potential for real controversy. But ensuring people are climate literate is an essential element of the global response to this climate crisis. The European Commission is driving Europe's ambition to lead the fight against climate change. And as part of the Green Deal, the Commission has launched a European climate power Act to give all Europeans a voice in, in the design of new climate actions such as information exchange, grassroots activities and showcasing real world solutions. Many EU citizens clearly understand the urgency of global warming, but the issue reveals some complex social and economic divides. The less privileged can perceive the debate as elitist, for example, while a privileged few may worry about the end of the world, the majority worries about getting to the end of the month. And this has led to movements such as the Gilets Jaunes in France. So today we'll discuss climate literacy and how the strengthening of climate education and engagement can be one of the most effective ways to change carbon neutral societies by 20 2050, and we'll ask who should take the lead, policymakers, teachers, media, or activists. Today we're joined by uh, Clara Della Torre, Deputy Director General DG Clima, the European Commission, Lydia Pereira, Member of the European Parliament from Portugal, uh, George Marshall, Founding Director of Climate Outreach, uh, Julie Fedorchuk, a writer and lecturer at the School of Eco Poetics at Warsaw's Institute of Reportage, and Julian Popov, former Minister of Environment for Bulgaria, a member of the Advisory Council of EIT Climate Kick. Welcome to all of you. I'm just going to ask each of you to kick off with a short opening statement, about 60 seconds or so, Clara Del Torre, you'd like to go first? 60 seconds. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Um, we are all, um, the European Union has decided to, 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 to be the first part of the world uh, going climate neutral. And to do that, we require, of course, laws, we require the targets, we require, we require money, the investments for, for this massive change. And this massive change needs to be done in a fair way. But all this is necessary, but it is not enough. Uh, to succeed, we need to have a shift in mindset. We have to, to go out a little bit of our comfort zones and to change behavior. And with the pact that, as you were saying, has been launched this morning by Executive Vice President Timmermans, we are trying to help uh, to, to, to make sure that this, that, this, uh, that this transformation takes place and that everyone, everyone can participate and everyone realizes that he or she has a responsibility in it and can do something. There is no uh, small action when we are dealing with, uh, with land. The Commission itself will be, and we can come afterwards with the mechanisms where you can participate in the pact, but we will ask for pledges, people committing to do something for the climate and then being accountable for that. The Commission will be launching, as you've read in the Green Deal, its own, its own pledge. The Commission would like, as an institution, to become climate neutral in 2030. So the, this, is, this, is, this is what we want to do with, uh, with the pact, and we'll come back to that. But you are all welcome to come shift mind, change, little changes in every day will help in reaching our climate neutrality in 2050. Thank you. Right. Clara Dottori, thank you. Lydia Pereira, 60 seconds, floor is yours. Hello and uh, good afternoon to everyone. It's a, uh, uh, I'm delighted to be here this afternoon to discuss uh, a topic that I love and that I have the opportunity to combine um, with my other committee, um, uh, economy. And I would like, when we talk about climate, um, I think it is important to um, uh, to say that everyone communicates about climate, um, and this conference is how to talk climate. Um, we talk, we communicate about climate, about environment uh, on a daily basis. Uh, whether is it by sharing a social media post or taking a reusable bottle of water uh, to the office or school or or to the parliament, talking with friends over coffee about the Amazon fires uh, that uh, have you know uh, waken up the world. Uh, into action, signing a petition against uh, state aid for fossil fuels or voting based on a party's agenda on climate change. So everyone takes uh, its, um, takes its uh, uh, takes, uh, own actions to address the, the climate and to communicate climate and environment. Uh, what I think it is very necessary uh, in the coming months and years is 
to embrace everyone in 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 driving the, the change as clara was uh, saying we we need everyone we have to have the public sector the private sector civil society completely convoked to this big challenge um, and this is not only by you know doing the diagnosis like we know the numbers we know we have to take action and i think and particularly um, political parties, um, institutions in, in general, we have to uh, deliver. It's not uh, the, the time has passed to only, uh, you know, uh, making these beautiful speeches and, 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 and comforting heartfelt uh, speeches, but it is not enough. It's time to take action. And I think um, that this is where we, I, can make a difference. Thank you. George Marshall, 60 seconds. Um, microphone. <laughs> Thank you. Um, in climate outreach, we are we wish to see people talking about access to information and understanding of climate change as a basic right. We haven't as yet had enough of a rights dialogue on this. I mean, of course, it's a moral right. I mean, people have a moral right to understand what's happening and how it's going to impact their lives, so that they can make informed decisions. But it's also a legal right. Uh, in the Paris Agreement, in, in um, Article 6, in the original Framework Convention, um, in the Aarhus Convention that all of the countries in Europe signed on to, all of these clearly stipulate and require that governments communicate with and engage their citizens in climate change and participate in policy. And I have to say they very largely failed to do so. There, ha there is a scattering of initiatives, but the level of investment is very, very low. There's no benchmarks, there's no performance criteria. There's a huge amount of evidence now on how to do this well and effectively, which is still not implemented. I really think we need to be taking lessons from the COVID experience of how essential public engagement has been and continue to roll out. We need to see some proper investments in this. And our understanding doing research right across Europe is that currently understanding of climate change is superficially strong. People say they're very concerned, but actually in reality, it's shallow. People have a very weak understanding of climate change, what it is, and especially how urgent action is. And to repeat what we've heard from, from everybody else, it is an essential underpinning for all policy, but we have a broad-based public mandate to take action on climate change. This is not icing on the cake. For 30 years, people have thought this is just like marketing something. It isn't. It's actually fundamental to moving forward on policy. Thank you, George. Uh, Julia Fedorchuk. Uh, it's, it's lovely to be here. And um, uh, I'm here as someone who works with language. I'm a teacher and a writer. And um, I'm a teacher of uh, what is called the environmental humanities um, and also a teacher of literature. And uh, I, I, I do think that education is one of the foundations for effective climate, uh, climate action because it has to be systemic. And because it has to be systemic, we need education and we need uh, to implement um, uh, climate literacy and more broadly um, ecological competence on every level. It has to be done through education. It has to be done through culture, through the mass media um, and so on and so forth. Um, in order, I, well, what I think has to come across very clearly is that there is no outside to ecology, contrary to what people think. Uh, no human activity, no sphere of human life can be um, separated from the planet and from the life-sustaining systems of this planet, right? Ecology is connected with economy, it is connected with human well-being, even with things such as religion or psychology or ethics or the rights of minorities or women's rights and so on and so forth. Now, in order to really understand this, um, we need the kind of competence that science gives us. Obviously, I do believe that ecology should be a subject in schools, but we also need a softer kind of competence that the arts give us, yes? And I say this as, um, as a lecturer in the School of Ecopoetics, which is um, an educational initiative in Warsaw, backed by Climate Kick, where we believe that um, the uh, climate catastrophe is in some sense a catastrophe of imagination, right? So we also think that a kind of uh, competence has to be built and nourished that involves ethics, that if no involves precisely the imagination that involves uh, uh, telling ourselves new, better, less destructive stories about our relationship, about how we relate to um, 
the rest of the world, uh, to other beings in the world, both uh, uh, human and, and non-human, to how we build a genuine responsibility for our neighborhoods, our sense of connection with, with other inhabitants of the planet, but also with such things as a sense of wonder and beauty and joy, because there is no successful action, um, no successful activism um, without, without um, joy. So the okay. assumption behind... Okay. So the assumption is that in addition to new technologies, we also need new stories and new metaphors. Sorry. Perfect. Thank you. We'll come back to those issues in just a moment as well. And uh, Julian Popov, 60 seconds. Thank you, Brian. Um, when we talk clim uh, climate, uh, we do uh, need, in my view, to speak uh, with data. We need to speak with science, but we also have to speak with history and with geography. Uh, we have to spread the story, and I think telling the story is very important. But we shouldn't spread panic. And there is quite a, a widely spread uh, a tendency to try to spread panic, but we have to tell stories of problems, because there is a problem, there is a crisis, but we also have to tell stories of solutions. And, um, and I think this is one of the things that uh, Climate Kick is doing very well in uh, developing the, the, the wide variety of solutions across wide geography. And this is what I think we should do. And if we want to, to speak, we have to also engage, because speaking and preaching is not enough. We have to engage people so that make people tell their stories. And finally, we um, need to uh, constantly deal with, uh, with skeptics. Uh, we live in time of populistic skepticism, and we have to rebuff, uh, rebuff the, um, uh, the, the myths of skeptics. And uh, one rule that I learned from a, uh, a great climate communicator, don't let the skeptics change the subject keep them to the subject until they uh, kind of uh, understand and admit their defeat. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Julian. Clara, uh, something George uh, said struck me is that most of Europe is uh, superficially, has a superficially strong knowledge of climate. That's your big challenge, isn't it? Is that there's a bit of apathy there. People don't really engage to the level that you need them to, to produce solid action. How do you plan to use the Climate Pact to get around this problem, to really deepen this uh, knowledge of uh, the climate reality? Um, this is one of the major functions of the, of the pact, precisely. Um, we are writing saying that, uh, that the knowledge uh, about climate change is not very well spread, but, but awareness that there is a problem is fortunately increasing. But um, as Mr. Popov was saying, we have to base our discourse in science. And therefore, in the Climate Pact, we will have, for example, a knowledge hub where we will try to, we are already doing that, and there are many people who have already done that very well, and we'll try to put it there, to translate um, um, scientific information into information that is, is telling to the, to the citizen. Um, we have also to, to, to make a place where people exchange their knowledge, people exchange their experiences. And I think by, by, telling, by knowing more of a subject, usually you are more interested, you are more bound to act, um, you, you can become probably, we will have ambassadors of the pact, and by knowing more of the subject, you might like to become an ambassador, uh, we will, someone who will be able to talk to specific communities, specific constituencies, spreading the good word, and uh, and also giving um, giving concrete examples of how things can change, also putting information at uh, there where is needed from the angle where is needed, uh, showing the bad size of the of the affair because they are very bad size as as previous speakers have said. Um, but also showing that um, that by doing something uh, against the climate uh, the climate change we can 
we can have also positive stories. We have a better health, better life, okay. um, less costs. Uh, so it's a, it's a, it's a, a different source of information that the pact is going to to put at everybody's disposal. Okay, thank you, Georgia. On this, uh, this this topic of superficial uh, knowledge, which uh, most Europeans have, how do you think you break through uh, this this narrative and make it deeper and make it compelling enough for people to uh, do something rather than just listen? I I very much welcome what Clara is saying about um, bringing in communicators. Um, Really, what people need is they, we, we, we understand climate change through the medium of narrative, as, as we've heard already. Um, and therefore, what's really important is that people can hear and receive a story which really speaks to their identity and their own values. And that means, therefore, we, we need to uh, have different messages for different audiences. And we need to really start not with a question of how do we communicate climate change as such, but what is it that motivates people to have a sense of identity and commitment to a collective purpose? What makes them proud? What makes, what makes them have a sense of something that's special to them? And then we need to construct the climate change narratives out of it. So I guess there's a content and a process, but content is what we need to be thinking very carefully about what speaks to people's values. We have to stop alienating people by trying to impose external values on them. I think that's been a mistake of myself and colleagues in the environmental movement. What does that many, mean, ex imposing external values on people? Well, I think the classic case that we've seen actually hasn't been in Europe, but it's been in, uh, in North America in particular, where the language of climate change communications has become so associated with one political worldview that people who don't share that worldview reject the entire, the entire thing. It, it says you have to be like us and you have to come on board for our whole agenda. I think we need very, if we are serious about reaching all people, um, we need to recognize that those people have different ways of seeing the world and there isn't a, a single way of doing it. And therefore, we need different communicators working through different networks and maybe with quite different narratives. Okay. Uh, Lydia Pereira, you spoke about the time for speeches and fine words is done. What's different about this in your view? What's different about the climate pact? Is this more uh, window dressing with the European flag on it or are you convinced this is going to deliver uh, action this time? Well, I think it's a little of both. And um, I think it is um, because the reason why I said that um, the, the time for beautiful speeches, maybe it's coming to an end, it's because um, there is a wider um, awareness than it used to be years ago. And yet uh, the work of the European Commission, uh, of the European Union towards um, fighting climate change started long ago and uh, the, the the, the big milestone was probably in 2007, 2008, um, and it, it has been a continued work uh, addressing addressing this topic. Um, but I also think, so I, I guess um, also uh, the, the strikes that we've witnessed uh, a little bit across the world, uh, led by uh, Greta Thunberg, that then led to a different uh, discussion about the potential fight between economy and environment where I completely disagree because I, we have to work with both and we have to um, keep the um, uh, equal opportunities for everybody, regardless of uh, uh, how we, we, we will achieve our long-term objectives, such as uh, being uh, um, climate neutral by 2050. But we have to deliver for everybody. So uh, the reason why I was mentioning uh, communication is because uh, we we engage in in conversations um, with our um, within our networks um, in media online. Uh, we could we each and every one of us contributes to the spread of of information on on these topics and on these forums. And so we can drive we can transform public perceptions of the environment and our relationship with it. Um, so I think these social circles are our potential sphere of influence. Um, and, and the discussions about environmental concerns uh, often happen outside of the government meeting rooms. Um, and in ancient Greece, the public meetings, uh, spaces and forums were where citizens gathered to exchange ideas, discuss uh, community problems were called agoras 
which is uh, the same concept that is now taken for the Conference of the Future of Europe. But nowadays we have different agoras. We communicate both online, offline, whether with someone across the globe and then different time zones. Um, so everyone matters and the ordinary European citizen plays a crucial part in the fight to protect our environment. Uh, so I think uh, it is very important that um, we, we, we take consideration of this and uh, knowing that the, our communication has changed so dramatically in the past, I would say, 10 years, uh, okay. that the dissemination of information has to reflect the new reality of communication, particularly in uh, the use of social media, in the use of uh, influencers, which are uh, usually they have their own agenda, but it's also important that we can okay. bring them. Let me put this to, to, the, let me put this to, to Julian as well. Julian, you, you, you touched on some of this earlier. You, we have a different set of influencers today. I, I like the, the point about the, the Agora, and, but it also reflects this, this separation between uh, the, the senators and the, the, those who would make the decisions uh, in, in ancient Greece and those who would give their opinion. You know, are, are we still going to suffer from this a separation uh, of uh, the public from the political reality? Or do you see a new uh, change coming? Macron, for example, President Macron has announced that next year there'll be a referendum uh, to enshrine uh, climate, uh, climate rights within the, the French constitution as well. Is there something which is changing in this, uh, this narrative where the talk is ending and action is beginning? Julian. Yeah, there, there is a change, definitely. There is a change in the political um, uh, debate and the relationship between uh, voters and, and politicians. Um, and, and the change is strange. It is very much driven by the, by the social media. And the, the problem is that um, uh, social media loud voices as in, and influences are becoming um, over uh, influencing very often and uh, defining and uh, and guiding the political decisions and this leads to uh, very often abandoning of the scientific advice and the scientific voices and we can see that very clearly now with the coronavirus story so we we have to be very clear in sticking to um, to the science and the stories and but also ask people to to tell their stories not to turn into preachers and going around and telling what is the climate story but ask and listen also uh, what is the climate story but and how do you think that translates that... into action though how do you think that really translates into action because this has got to be the the, the real outcome from the climate pact it can't be uh, more conversation. The, the, the actionable outcome from this discussion you've just described, how do we get there? How do, how do those we, conversations... We, which is, I mean, I, I'll, I'll give an example a few, a few years ago, well, uh, after the, the Arab Spring, actually. I went to Tunisia and uh, to, um, we, we were setting up their uh, school of politics. And one thing that I wanted to speak is that I will tell them now a lot about climate change. And the first thing, the first time I said, well, this is... This, this is something very serious. And, and the answer came immediately. Yes, we know very well because of the desertification of our land. So, and, and suddenly I realized that it is not me who will go and tell them what climate change is. It is they, they will tell me a very, very interesting and serious story about that. So we have to go around and uh, including the influencers and uh, um, and the speakers and the leaders have to go around and listen and encourage people to tell their stories. Uh, how exactly that will happen? Uh, logistically, um, uh, your active can help a lot. Uh, Climate Kick can help a lot. All these networks that are covering Europe can help a lot to extract the real stories of success, of problems that uh, people can say. Okay, let, let me ask Julia. Julia, you, you, you work in the art world, you work with the, the, the media on different levels. Pop culture uh, through the ages and its relevance today. How does pop culture influence how we see things, how we're prepared to act and how these new influencers emerge? 
Mm -hmm. Well, I think it does it in, in, in many different ways. And uh, the stories that pop culture is giving us are not always uh, maybe the most effective stories. Because when it comes to um, climate change and generally the environment, I think the narrative that is sort of uh, uh, that very easily comes to comes to mind is uh, is the narrative of the apocalypse. Yes, so a lot of so we get a lot of movies, we get a lot of stories that have this apocalyptic sort of scenario, and this is not such a great story. Uh, it's not a story that gives us a sense of agency. Yes, because uh, I agree very much with what people said before me about like letting people uh, uh, know and understand that it's about them, that it's about their story, that it's it's about things which are vitally important to them. But another crucial problem from my, or my perspective as a teacher is that people generally have very little sense of individual agency, right? That even when they uh, know uh, uh, relatively a lot about uh, climate science, they feel like completely helpless. And so uh, this, this dominant uh, pop cultural narrative, which is an apocalyptic narrative saying that, oh, we're headed for destruction and it's going to be the end and uh, 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 there's nothing that can be done, especially on individual level. This is something that takes the sense of agency away from people because either you know there's a miracle and a superhero shows up and saves us in the last minute, or we, go and explode and in any way there's nothing to be done so the sense of there's nothing to be done uh, we can say that it's actually a new form of denialism which is much uh, uh sort of uh, uh, bigger in a sense than the denialism of people who say there is no climate change because not so okay, many so people you're, just to be clear you're more worried about people who say we can't do anything about this more so yes. than the people who say climate yes. change doesn't exist yes. yeah, okay. yeah people Julian... who say okay let's continue Mm -hmm. Okay, Julian, I just want to ask you and then go back to, to George in this as well. And this is the point of what I wanted to get to as well, is that you know, people feel they know the story, they're going to tell their stories, and then they're going to say to government, well, you sort it out because I can't do anything. Isn't that what's going to happen? Or is it going well, to be different? That, that, is a, that, that is a problem and we have to avoid it. And uh, we, we, we have to not just explain the problem, but explain the individual and the small solutions and the fact that Everybody can contribute. Everybody also can, uh, something that Clara mentioned earlier, uh, can actually benefit from, uh, from uh, many of the actions and could benefit not just in some distant future, but could benefit in an immediate future. Uh, the low cost of renewables, the clean air, and, and many other benefits that are related with the climate action. So do, do you think we need nudge, that we can nudge use behavior? We need to, to construct not, nudge behavior out of this. Yes, not, nudge behaviors and nudge economies should probably be uh, introduced as a, as a compulsory subject in the European Parliament, European Commission, and all governments. <laughs> Thank you. George, and then we'll bring Clara in on this. So, George, you, from your research, you, do you see this like a, a rock the vote kind of campaign? The climate pact is is uh, the 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 not just the ambassador, but it's the candidate here. And ro rock the vote is not just about uh, getting people to pay attention, but it's getting them to go out and vote and to participate in the process in a clear way where they will actually see a return. How how from your research do you think? Uh, the the buy-in, the public buy-in, uh, will be accepted to this point. I well, we we've been looking at the at the pact um, since it was originally proposed, and pledges are worthwhile to a degree. I can see that it's a rallying cry to try and bring people together, but all of the evidence suggests that actually what leads to sustained changes in behaviour is when people internalise that change of behaviour into a clear mark of their identity in other words that they that they behave in a certain way because a it becomes habitual but also b it becomes a part and a statement of who they are and there's a bit of a danger with people just signing a pledge that it's that that doesn't by itself reach beyond um the usual suspects of the people who will say yeah sure i'll sign up to that and doesn't actually get um additionality most of the pledge projects that have been run around the world before now and we've had big ones in my own country ireland had a very large one um, Australia had a big one, Canada had a huge one um, around sort of 10, 15 years ago, didn't actually in the end produce any evidence of additionality. What really makes the difference is when uh, there's a wider change in society but within people's social norm and the world around them. 
they can see that other people like themselves are doing something. There's always the danger on a huge issue like climate change is you do something and you go, well, you know, as we were hearing from Julia, what, what's the point? Um, you know, the, the agency, but you look around and you just go, well, they're not doing anything, or they're not doing anything, or that country over there isn't doing anything. So in the end, behavior depends on people saying, well, never mind what other people do. I do this because this is who I am. That means then that the overall framing and the overall networking of the pledge impact is so, so essential. Because okay, really, me, I think the... That's the let, me ask, let me ask Clara exactly about this. Clara, you, we have to learn from previous campaigns from, and large social movements in the past to see what's worked. I'm struck by, I don't know if you've seen Ruth Bader Ginsburg's uh, documentary at uh, RBG, but you, the idea that we accept uh, as normal today the identity politics of, of uh, women's rights, for example, which uh, you know, 40 years ago was just something barely uh, on, on the radar in the terms that we accept it today. But people like Ruth Bader Ginsburg took the long view and they began this incremental process, and she wasn't the first, of course, but they began this process of reforming the United States uh, gender rules. Uh, and they, she constructed it around the sense of identity and, as George said, the wider change to where a social norm actually changed as well. Are there movements like this that the Commission has, has viewed as you know, success stories which can be replicated and led to the construction of the pact? I think there are, there are, I mean, in history, you've mentioned uh, women's rights. We've seen what was the Industrial Revolution. We see what was the French Revolution. And uh, we are now in face of a, of, a, of, a, of a revolution of another nature, but it's still a revolution. Um, so um, apart from all what we have discussed about, uh, about uh, sharing information, raising awareness, there is an issue of acceptance of, I like what George was saying, of, of, of values which are external to you. So it's a question of well understanding the benefits of a changing of behavior, the, the, um, the, the, the peer pressure is, it works quite well in society. So this is why, um, I don't know whether the pledges, uh, that's, that's a very good question. They, they, are, they, they really represent additionality. But where I think um, uh, it, is, it is important is that they, they make a peer pressure that so people are, are more motivated to do like his, her peers, like people from their social environment. Also visibility, the pact will help in doing visibility. And we know that as human beings, people appreciate very much visibility and they are very much motivated to different extents, different people. So um, I, I, I don't, there will not be a revolution uh, in, in the traditional sense of the word, but we need indeed a revolution like those that have, uh, you have mentioned. And for that, we need acceptance of the fact and acceptance of the, of the fact that it is urgent, but it is not too late. We can do things, show little steps, take more public transport, eat a little bit less of meat uh, during the week, uh, um, change your policy with uh, with um, uh, desemballage. I'm sorry, I can't remember the name in English. So, um, voilà, voilà. So it's a change in behavior and acceptance of new ways of doing things. And indeed, some, some change in identity, probably, yes, which is the most difficult. Lydia Pereira, this, this, this pop culture movement, and you know, if we take anything positive from COVID-19, it's, it's clear that the elements that Clara has just described uh, of this, uh, this change in public behavior, this, this gradual uh, peer pressure. You know, who would dare go out in most of our in general environments without a mask uh, these days as well? And you know, the, the disapproval of our colleagues if we, if we sit uh, at the same table of, uh, with them close by without, without a mask. You know, it's just unheard of. And yet with this, happened, this change in the sense of uh, communal responsibilities happened within a relatively short uh, period of time. Do you think this Will this COVID experience will change the cli climate dynamics and sense of communal responsibility as well? Well, I think um, one thing, well, it, probably, yes. Um, but we also have to bear in mind that, um, as I was saying in the beginning, we use a variety of communication um, means to, to express and develop uh, our thoughts and concerns about 
the various issues and climate and, and now with the COVID-19 as well. And we are also, uh, the way we interpret and process information is also shaped by those with whom we interact. Uh, either our colleagues, our family, uh, politicians, teachers, people that we relate to, right? Uh, and also, so through these daily interactions, um, our understanding of environmental problems um, uh, facing Europe or the pandemic at the moment, uh, the, the economic recovery and so on, how we perceive the actions that others, um, of others in, these, in, this, in the same space are shaped not, o not only by the nature of the information that uh, we receive, but also by the ways in which uh, the different messages are communicated across. Um, and so I think um, in this regard, um, and, and particularly in, in what concerns me uh, in politics, we do need to improve our communication, not only on environment, but of course in different, uh, in, in these various issues. And um, we do not need um, to raise again, I mean, we have to keep raising awareness, um, but we have to avoid eventually to communicate uh, repeating complex statistics and scientific statements. Well, we have to defend science-based policy. And uh, in that sense, I, I very much agree um, uh, with what was said uh, before. Uh, in, in relation to this, but what I'm what I'm referring to is the complexity of, of things that sometimes are difficult for people that usually nowadays don't go and eventually double check the information they get, and, and so we have to think about um, simple and impactful uh, messaging uh, because otherwise, and um, we might fall in the trap that. Uh, we have loads of information available, but we cannot uh, process, Can process uh, all of that. Okay. Yeah. Let me ask uh, Clara as well. You, we're going to talk about ed education in a bit more detail here as well. You, this information is not something uh, unique just for uh, climate change. We have it uh, on a whole range of issues today. And uh, you, the, the general education level that uh, Europeans need today simply to be able to get the right facts and, as Lydia said, to be able to process this information in, in the right way. You know, the Climate Pact is not a standalone uh, a tool, a standalone uh, approach. You're really embedding this with other policies across the European Union, including with the economy and the recovery package as well. You know, how, do you, how do you join all these dots together without uh, losing focus? <laughs> That's a, that's a, that's a, it's it's a difficult it's a, it's a challenge you know that in 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 um, in in our public service terms we say the mainstreaming of climate policy in all policies but indeed we are um, um, everybody has agreed that in the recovery package we the member states have to present programs um, plans where at least 37 percent of the of the resources have to be invested in uh, climate um, in climate uh, related actions so i mean if 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 we are convincing already finance ministers that there is a good deal of investment that is needed i think we are doing a very good step forward um we are uh, in 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 the in, in education for example where we know that the union has uh, very little competence, and very often this competence is is uh, is, um, is local or regional. But when we work with our colleagues of DG of DG AC, they are very supportive, and you know that they have a number of networks and structured dialogues which manage to bring uh, uh, the discussion on climate to the to the education uh, realm. And when we are talking about industrial policy, that's clear. That's clear that uh, that industrial policy and climate policy are are, are 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 bound to each other. I mean, we have to have an industrial policy which is which is uh, which is leading uh, to the European Union to have technological sovereignty that uh, that we have um, that is uh, able to offer opportunities for uh, European industry to export outside. So. Um, it, in research and innovation, it's clear 35% of the framework program is going to be invested in climate uh, in climate actions, and whether it is it is uh, in in the parts which are directly linked to climate and environment or in others like in transport or industry, climate is being embedded. And I think 
more and more is as we were saying before everybody is not everybody unfortunately but many people are convinced that we need to do something and then those shaping the policy with a little help of those of us working in climate policy are are, are, are really embedding climate in all the other okay. policies it's not easy but we are getting there Thank you. Julian, uh, you, we have some tools available today that perhaps previous generations uh, weren't able to, to leverage. For example, you know, this week, we, just within this one week, we have competition law uh, mandating that disinformation uh, will come at a high price, uh, Commissioner Vestager, uh, to changing some of the, the, the streaming of this and also the Digital Services Act as well. You know, in, in coding these elements, uh, Commissioner uh, Breton as well, you, we have these different tools that can function on a global scale and provide European leadership. But also, if you want to compete within the European market, you've got to have your house in order, whether that's in terms of the information that you allow through your platforms or your industrial policy, as Clara mentioned as well, if you want to compete in the single market. You know, do we have a huge advantage, perhaps, that uh, previous generations didn't have? And so the climate pact is, is really embedded uh, almost already uh, across the many strands of society. Yes, we have uh, obvious advantage. We are benefiting right now. I were talking on, uh, I don't know, know even which one of the many um, platforms, online platforms. Uh, we have the advantages of, of social media, of instant information, hyperconductivity around the world. Um, it is also a risk because this uh, um, uh, social media uh, world uh, opens the, the opportunities for a uh, very high level of an instant and extreme populism. So we, we have to balance between these two and fight the populism, fight the skepticism. And one, one area that while you're talking about uh, the, 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 the European competitiveness, uh, we, we do compete on words very much that uh, Europe is the leader, climate leader in the world, climate leader in the world, and we, we are holding on to that kind of statement too kind of strong. And that creates the impression among many people, especially in Eastern Europe, that uh, this is some kind of a Brussels agenda that's imposed by Western Europe on Eastern Europe. And that's totally wrong. And we we have to be careful with this narrative because we are all in that together and uh, countries like Japan, like, like China now, like uh, South Korea and many others are committing to climate neutralities. And we have to present that also as a common effort, not just as some kind of a, a Western European uh, leadership of the world. Uh, because this is one of the of the risky perceptions that you can get in in Eastern Europe, not only Eastern Europe inside the European Union, but in places like uh, I don't know Turkey or or the Western Balkans and and Russia and uh, other places, uh, which we have uh, massive impact on. Thank you, uh, George. You know we mentioned earlier about the gilets jaunes and the identity politics involved in that as well, but. The basic reality is you know, poor people are going to pay a heavier price for climate change and yet they seem to be less involved in the political discourse uh, to the point that disinformation within uh, populism is aimed at rejection of government policies which would largely be uh, useful for, for climate action. You know, how, do, how do we square this circle and, and uh, Julian just mentioned the East-West narrative as well which has its own disinformation and populist uh, dynamics for climate uh, change? Well, first of all, I challenge what you just said, Brian, that the assumption that, that climate change, or certainly that the costs of climate change fall disproportionately on the, on the less well-off. There's also, as we know, a range of, of new opportunities and benefits, especially in employment, which come down the line. The question is whether the sources of information are trusted on that. I mean, in our research, we're actually we're just conducting research right across Europe now with hundreds of focus groups on attitudes towards transition. And it's clear that there is a deep distrust of government communicators when it comes to, to talking about um, transition or economic benefits. So we're already, and that of course was when the gilets jaunes actually was only partly about carbon pricing, really that was just a, a lightning rod for widespread discontent and distrust of the government. 
So I think we need to recognize that the trust and uh, trust and respect and feeling that you're listened to is fundamental. I think the starting point is for people to feel that they're listened to. In other words, engagement is a two-way process. This is not about finding some nice uh, slogan or advertising campaign. This is about having a policy where people feel listened to and they feel that what they have to say is, is actively involved in the policy. I think it's about making the jobs and the opportunities real to people. That means concentrating on policy that generates benefits in people's own communities. And we know, for, we know that some policies deliver more local benefits than others. So for example, renovation of housing stock is something which people can see in their own lives and their local jobs, whereas large scale solar collectors in North Africa is not. So I think, I think that I guess the point we keep coming back to is that at every level, including the design of policy, there needs to be a consideration about whether this will, whether this will build public support, whether this will be communicated well, and whether this is the kind of thing which will bring people increasingly on board, rather than policy just being designed as some technocratic process about like, what gets the maximum bang for your buck. Okay. Uh, Julia, you, you mentioned earlier about the apocalyptic uh, approach being the wrong one, but in virtually every other realm of political life, the apocalypse gets people uh, motivated and the negative advertising that we, we see so much of in, in electoral campaigns, uh, you know, the psychology behind this, basically it's 10 times more expensive to, uh, prom to promote a, a positive message uh, with a positive outcome than it is to sow fear and produce uh, an outcome from that as well. So is this just a matter of throwing more money at uh, a positive message or uh, should we uh, go for the cheap option and just talk up the apocalypse? Uh, no, no, no. I think I think we need a positive message rather than the apocalypse. The apocalypse may maybe motivate people to stand up against someone, right? But it doesn't really help people to feel uh, that they have um, something positive to do, some positive uh, uh, change to uh, to achieve in their in, the, in their lives. So I think it's very uh, well when I when I uh, talked earlier about the importance of a kind of competence that involves both. Um, um, uh, climate science, so just the knowledge of, of what is happening with climate and these softer values such as ethics, such as, uh, such as you know, having to do with, um, with values, with the sense of our, of our personal values, um, but also with psychology, for instance. Um, I think um, when it comes to the more positive stories and the more positive solutions, one thing is that when, if people are to accept the necessity of change, if they are to accept the necessity of this revolution, um, we also have to understand that this happens at a certain psychological cost, that there is a psychological toll. People feel a lot of anxiety, people feel a lot of fear, and this is blocking them from accepting the truth. This is like even if they know, they really know on some level that change is necessary, that the situation is serious. So that's so I think there's a lot to be done in this psychological uh, uh, sphere. Yes, that people need help, people need to be able to work this change through to somehow to be able to uh, um, uh, act as agents. Um, and second of all, I so think ba that- So basically uh, we need a kind of, uh, we need a kind of group therapy if that's the approach, is it? That we do not need a, diminish. a kind of group therapy. <laughs> and also I think we need, uh, instead of like one big story, whether it's the apocalypse or something else, we need a lot of small stories which are close to what people actually experience, which are close to their own neighborhood, which are close to their own city, and the, the stories that show that show them that the stories that they articulate okay. also. I yeah. just want to ask uh, Clara and then uh, George that wants to comment as well. Clara, it seems to me the pact is like a town hall approach to politics as well. Right? So you, this is bring the people together in the locality, allow them to express to uh, decision makers what they feel needs to be done, allow the decision makers the opportunity to respond, but to show concrete benefit in the local community and as George is saying, that trust element should grow as a consequence as well. Would you describe this like a town hall? Um, I have no thought of doing that. What is a way of describing it like a town hall? I don't know. I don't master English as well to know whether it has a pejorative yeah, connotation. <laughs> <laughs> so if this is the case, certainly not. But in what we want, indeed, this is, this is the, the is a, is a bottom-up approach. It is indeed, there is the grassroots activities that are the ambassadors, the people, those that have to lead the way. In regulation, in financing, 
we have a bottom a top down approach i mean we have governments we have investors who do that but here is is a uh, is a uh, is, is the opera. and to facilitate this 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 bottom up this this these grassroots activities we have chosen four fields where to start with one the green areas so we were talking about things that are close to people but let us do things about tree planting caring of of trees another area green mobility if you, we talk about cycling uh, infrastructure or charging infrastructure, renovation that George mentioned, which on top of all the benefits for the building, for the energy bill, on top of that, it creates a lot of a lot of um, jobs because it's, it's work intensive. Um, doing things on green skills uh, and encouraging those regions that are using the just uh, just transition mechanism to really um, really recycle workers and so. Um, Town hall or not, but what it okay. is, what it is, the short impact is precisely the actions and the people and the understanding. Just a quick note on, on trees. I think in the Commission's document published earlier this year, uh, the indication was 3 billion extra trees planted in the EU by 2030. That's huge. That's, uh, that's not something which will be invisible. Okay, George, you wanted to, to add a comment. Then I want to take some questions. We have lots of questions from the audience. And I encourage you to please keep sending questions on the Q&A panel and also tweet hashtag EA debates as well. George, uh, you had a comment to make. Uh, a quick comment on these apocalyptic narratives. I mean, I guess if there's anything that 20 years of listening to people has told me is we have to be very, very careful of not bringing in our own bias into assumptions about what works or what does not work. And most of us working in the climate field, we're positive minded, we see positive solutions. But just to tell you, when we test those messages in focus groups uh, and we say, hey, you know, big business will sort it out. There's lots of exciting technologies. Those narratives often bomb as well, but they seem to be elitist and top down. So what I'd say is I'd say the important thing is you start, as we were hearing just now, bottom up, which means listening. And if people are motivated by by, by narratives which are about concerns and fears for the future, which many people have, that needs to be reflected. So I think always reflects your audience's values and concerns in the messaging. Okay, just on that, uh, we have a question from uh, Erve uh, Kammerlink, um, who says, you can take this one, George. How do you see the role of heavy industries like cement in the communication towards the large public? Erve, I'm guessing you work in the cement industry, because uh, nobody else would have put that in there. George, the general point, how do you see heavy industries? What an expert. <laughs> Let's pass that okay. on to someone else. Okay, sure. Julia, how would you see uh, large industries uh, communicating towards the, the, the larger public? And then Lydia. Uh, large industries communicating to larger public? Yes. Do you think it's viable? Uh, uh, I'm an artist. I'm a writer. You know, I don't know. You know, I really don't know. I frankly don't know how a large industry, you know, like to convince them of what? <laughs> to, Lydia. Does everybody, um, do you, for example, let me put another context, look, cement's really niche. Um, for Coca-Cola, for example, plastics industry, drinks industry, those consumer products that go into our house, and Nespresso, for example, you know, the, these uh, the, the big producers, um, what role do they have in this, this process with the climate pact? Well, it's, uh, I actually, I have been having the opportunity to speak to uh, many businesses and uh, I, I see um, a wave of, um, of a wide awareness about the conscious that we, sh we have all to have in relation to climate. And I actually companies that are completely, um, they are completely um, uh, on board to implement the necessary changes that we have um, even in their internal processes, in their internal organization, uh, to address the question of, of climate change. And uh, if I may, I, I know the seventh uh, question uh, was uh, maybe a little too uh, concrete, um, but uh, in fact, I, I have received uh, some, some communication from from different from from different co um, from different companies. Uh, and they are also um, announcing that they they are planning to uh, change their energy uh, sources and uh, they want to comply with the um, w the big objective of being part of the of a, a climate neutral continent by 2050. So they do this and uh, they do this also internally with their uh, respective um, uh, workers. And uh, I think uh, that 
private uh, the private sector uh, once uh, that everyone is uh, aware of the necessary steps that we have to take uh, to address climate change that it drives a lot of other uh, it, it it drives other businesses to to be on board on this uh, on this big challenge so i i'm positive about what i have been witnessing and also because it's important for us that we we deal with the legislation that we speak to a, a vast majority of uh, of different uh, of different stakeholders uh, to fine tune as best as possible um, the quality of the legislation. But what I see uh, on the field is that there is this um, uh, this um, commitment from uh, the businesses from the private sector. Uh, with this agenda, and they are announcing it uh, using their own channels. And um, the way I see also at the in the financial sector, um, and yesterday we had a, some good news coming from the other side of the Atlantic Ocean uh, that uh, the R Federal Reserve is also uh, joining the network of um, central banks that want to drive change also um, in climate change. So I think you know everyone is doing uh, is doing a little bit of its part, um, and I think we are. Uh, I am optimistic. I think maybe we we are a bit slower than than uh, or or we are reacting a little bit later in the process. But we are doing everything we can, and in particular the businesses. I think we also have to say that um, they are uh, they are quite uh, they are quite. Um, on this uh, challenge, and okay. uh, I, I guess we, we, I guess we, we can expect something good. Okay, just to build on your uh, concrete proposal and uh, to answer Erv a little bit as well. Last week, um, EIT awards. Actually, I remember one of the nominees uh, sp specifically involved in cement and construction, and they were producing a product which uh, would save 50% uh, of the energy cost in terms of producing um, steel and cement uh, products as well for general construction. So um, not so far off the mark there either. Uh, Henny van Dongen, uh, lots of questions and remarks there, but one in particular, can the product uh, carbon footprint help in communi communicating uh, climate change uh, to the public? Clara, um, just to give us more perspective, so Massimo Bottura is an amazing Italian chef. Um, you, uh, Vice President uh, Timmermans had him on th this morning. Um, I wish we had, could have had him on the program today. That would have been uh, quite extraordinary. But he is an advocate um, f f exactly in terms of this, choosing uh, carbon-friendly uh, business models uh, as well. And so uh, from a consumer level, Clara, do you think that you know, part of the communication and part of the ambassador uh, role has got to be choose the right products, you know, understand what you're buying, understand where your money is going as well, so this consumer behavior changes because of ambassador and peer pressure? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, the, the, the consumer is, is, is fortunately each time uh, more better informed and make uh, better, more informed choices. But when you, when you buy uh, an airline ticket, you see often the, the CO2 equivalent. Uh, when you are organizing a travel, there, there are different apps that help you and there are methods which are which are not exactly equivalent, but they all show you they all show you which is for each uh, each voyage what is the best alternative you choose for food as you were as we're referring we we have to know how much uh, water is used for, for for producing some type of of uh, food and and some other so um, I don't want to do specific mentions but uh, um, so absolutely and and the pact aims also as well as, 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 as uh, highlighting initiatives and giving the tools for people to make well-informed choices. Just also, just to add on the IT award summaries last week, there were some uh, consumer-oriented apps which uh, allowed people to, to buy only products which had a certain carbon footprint. And I think this is part of the problem with decision-making as well, is that if it's too complex, as uh, Lilia was saying earlier, if the, comp the, the process is too complex, there's an opt-out. You're overwhelmed by the, the volume of information. So you know, the, the digital process of, of consuming uh, uh, greener products and reducing your carbon footprint is something I think we're going to see a lot more of in, in the next year. George, you wanted to comment? Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that um, I think the evidence suggests we should be somewhat skeptical of depending on consumer information for any of these changes. Um, even, in, even in areas which are very tangible for people, 
particularly, you know, dealing with obesity, dealing with healthy eating, labeling has had very limited and poor results. Um, the five a day program for, for healthy eating here in the UK has produced virtually no change in, in actual eating behaviors. And carbon is even less tangible. So I think we need to recognize that really what, we, what, what people want is they want governments to legislate on this and to create a framework which, which helps to reduce emissions. And then within that, they want to make behaviors which then can help to reduce it further having had that support. So um, I think, please, but if we this, just this end up process, with a carbon the labeling exercise, of, it becomes too abstract for people. But the process of regulation also Sorry. brings us back to the gilets jaunes. You know, it's Macron trying to explain to people who uh, don't live in the city that they're going to pay more for the fuel when they can least afford it as well. So, you know, is, is government going to be trusted to regulate in this? How, how, how nuanced will the policies be? And, and again, will the climate pact deliver the, the voice uh, that will uh, have this trust element in the policy process? George? Well, I can't answer for, for how the climate pact will operate, but I'd say that in, the, in the, the French experience, the policy was poorly constructed for not addressing those issues from the outset. Well, that's, that's, not a, that's not an unusual thing address. in public policy. <laughs> we need to we need to address social concerns from the outset. They could have started by actually asking people what they thought before launching it on them. Um, but I think that um, but I think that if we are serious about getting emissions down, we have to find a way for building that public mandate. So I think the, the challenge for public engagement is to create a situation where the public are supportive of strong policy action, including regulation, not of thinking that we can just pass it out and we can try and build support for personal action. I'm afraid I just don't think that's going to work. Okay, Lydia, the problem with the Gilets Jaunes was, was largely a sense of uh, you know, finance, hardship. And, but the COVID crisis has shown that money is there to be, uh, to be found for transitions and for uh, supporting the economy in, in a way which you know, five years ago nobody would have dared uh, propose. If you were a bank, you were getting a bailout. This time, pretty much the whole of Europe uh, got some sort of bailout. And the recovery package, you know, globally, we're looking at uh, sort of 10 trillion uh, euros, $10 trillion, dollars, in fact, uh, of governments uh, globally uh, with recovery packages for COVID. You know, are we learning the lessons from the Jean? Are we listening to people? Are we able now to respond in a, a more compassionate way and a more inclusive way uh, where this trust element will uh, perhaps stand a chance? Well, I, I, would, I, I wouldn't mix uh, directly the gilets jaunes with, with, the, with the outcome of, 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 the, of the latest developments when it comes to the uh, Council agreement and the different programs from the European Commission uh, to um, address the, the economic recovery. But I think it is, uh, it's more than that. I think it is the institutional response to what once uh, um, the former European Commission President Jacques Delors said, like Europe is like a bicycle and if we, if we stop um, cycling, uh, it, it will fall. And, and so um, I think a lot of lessons were learned from, from the previous crisis, which is of a complete, completely different nature from this one. Um, and therefore, um, Europe was, uh, uh, was not ready to respond, but was quick enough to uh, analyze the situation and, and deliver. And uh, I think the best example of it is that at the beginning of this pandemic, uh, there was a lot of uh, countries who were fighting uh, with each other because of masks, because of protective equipment and so on. And then the European Union, the European Commission um, uh, very quickly tried and, and actually succeeded in coordinating uh, all the different, uh, in the supply of the different materials necessary to each one member state which needed them in different stages of the development of the pandemic. And so I think on, so parallel to this, uh, the economic recovery uh, and the instruments, the the MFF, the recovery fund, uh, the program Next Generation EU, um, are a sign that uh, the, Europe has learned uh, has learned its its lesson uh, from the past, and that we we really have to um, make sure uh, that Europe is where it needs to be, because otherwise we might be creating, and this is particularly relevant to my generation because this is the second economic crisis that we are, we are facing in, in the last 10 years. Uh, the first one was in 2008, 2009, um, and then in Portugal it was 
basically during the Troika time well, between 2011 and 2014. So we are talking about a generation that might well, if, if, if there's no answers, if, uh, if we don't, if this generation doesn't see that they also have the same opportunities than their, the generations before, the it's parents' generation, right? Um, we might be creating a sort of um, a niche that can be explored by uh, uh, extremist forces uh, and question the need to belong to such an important project as the European but Union. This, this was, and so I this think goes, just to say this goes to the heart of what I was saying earlier. That this recovery process. It's, it wasn't just about fixing the economy. This was about protecting our democracy. We knew that if, if we didn't get it right this time, exactly the extremist forces, the confidence in the European project, it just was going to fail. There's, there was no more tolerance for getting this wrong. Um, so if there's anything we can look forward to the next crisis, that maybe we even we do a little better next time as well. I just We have some other questions here. I want to move on to this. Uh, Clara, one question for, for you. Are you planning to have minimum number of ambassadors in each member state? And if so, how can you achieve this? Any minimum numbers? No. No, 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 we have uh, no, no living numbers because the ambassadors, uh, um, anyone can be an ambassador provided uh, that person um, um, uh, subscribes the principles of the, of, of the pact, which we have in the communication, but transparency, honorability and things like this. But anyone can be. Um, uh, the ambassadors act on their own personal behalf, on the behalf of an organization, not on behalf of the European Commission. They are not paid. And uh, and uh, they are not supporting any other way except they are giving the tools via via they are giving the tools to 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 do their to do their their job of ambassadors. So there is no limit, and the, the more we have and the more varied origins we have, the better. So I invite everyone to 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 apply, and 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 become possibly a, a, a climate ambassador. Thank you, Julie. New comment to make on the Gilets Jaunes. Yes, just to a, a, a caution that uh, we very often associate uh, gilets jaunes with uh, climate policies. I'm very skeptical about the signing gilets jaunes movement to, to climate policies. Similar th things happened in Bulgaria in 2013, which is a widely cited uh, internationally case. Bulgaria raised the energy prices and the government resigned. That's simply not true that on the surface might look like that. So we have to examine these cases. Recently there was a, a temporary short blank out in um, California. Um, the whole world was covered with stories how California um, cut power supply because of renewable energy. It's simply not true. I mean, these cases, one by one, we have to rebut and examine more deeply because otherwise they become embedded in, in kind of mass perception uh, and, and just do damage because as Gilles Jean and the California and the Bogan case, things are much more complicated that, than, than just somebody introducing climate policies. Okay, thank you. I just, I'm going to take some more questions in just a moment, but there's a point I wanted to bring uh, back to Julia earlier, actually. Uh, Julia, you, Clara mentioned about the French Revolution, the Industrial Revolution. We mentioned women's rights as well. What lessons do you draw from these uh, previous experiences in terms of how you create an identity and communicate an identity which leads to, to real tangible action? Well, I think um, when you look at um, activists, uh, also artists and writers in the past, sometimes people were um, articulating positions which uh, seemed completely, um, completely impossible to, to accept by the wider public at their time, but yet they became revolutionary works. So I'm thinking, for example, about Rachel Carson, the American writer who um, uh, started American... Um, uh, environmental movement and who wrote about DDT and at the time when she wrote her um, best known book um, called Silent Spring she was rejected by pretty much everyone and yet in the end her book and her insight and also her talent in storytelling led to a change of policy and it also led to the fact that now we're thinking not only about chemicals in the ground but we're also thinking about the position of women in science so uh, Rachel Carson would be one example, but then if you look at uh, if you look at um, women rights activists from the past, or if you think about um, even African American slaves who um, who wrote um, 
uh, their um, their diaries, yes, or who 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 produced literature that uh, we now read uh, at literature classes, realizing that that was the beginning of um, um, of a revolution, yes, of a of a of a change that that took place and that is still taking place. Uh, you know, then we um, then what we learn is that uh, you know when people do what they have to do and when they really articulate. Um, uh, uh, their story, uh, then even though sometimes maybe it might seem that the impact is not obviously uh, uh, very effective immediately, um, it sometimes takes time uh, for us to to see the results. And I think this is this is very often what happens um, when it comes to arts, when it comes to the work of the imagination, that it's not always immediate, but it sometimes takes time for us okay. to see uh, how ideas grow and develop. Clara, is this how you envisage uh, the work of the pact, is that you're seeding the ground with multiple stories, with the reality of people's lives, and giving some time for that to grow? Yes, the pact will, will grow, because the pact is, is, is made out of uh, those that participate. So there will be parts which, are, which is information, as we were saying, but there will be other parts, which is what people bring to it. Uh, and, and, and the pact will certainly grow, um, we grow with society, uh, change with society, and we see, we know, and we've seen that last year, that sometimes the changes can be very deep and very quick, and we are in one of those moments. So yes, the, the pact will be will be moving forward, and and this is what it is needed, something which needs to be alive. Okay, thank you. Um, we're going to take just to uh, wrap up in just a moment. So I'm going to ask you for your comments. I'm just going to read some more uh, comments uh, from uh, the audience here. Uh, Regina Kreutz says, says, just a comment from a professional comms perspective, large companies cannot ignore the issue anymore because of their clients and their employees. And uh, let me see, Urs Thomas says, folks tend to believe what suits them. I uh, asked the question, is there a, a way around that to emphasize intergenerational equity? Uh, Freddie Apps uh, says, industry wants clear metrics, tools helping them to better estimate their own eco ecological and economic gains and to prioritize accordingly. And uh, we have another one from Anonymous who says, we need to bring young people on board, especially in secondary school students. They're quite depressed about the future. Christmas is coming and they can't be that depressed right now. And uh, why natural gas with regular CO2 production is green while nuclear energy with almost no CO2 production is not green. Uh, just to say that if we haven't read out your questions, uh, these will all be compiled and uh, produced uh, later on as well. So please uh, continue to send those and also for hashtag EA debates as well. Now, we're just about to wrap up. So I want to ask uh, each of our panelists uh, to summarize uh, in a nutshell what they think uh, this pact can do and how we should focus uh, for the future on this. George, let me start with you. Uh, just 30 seconds, the, the climate pact, what can it do and how should it do it? So I'd like to offer a, a challenge to, uh, to Clara and to uh, the governments of the European Union that um, pact I think is one step, but only one step towards Europe being a leader in public engagement. And this is the message that they should take to COP26. And that needs to be embedded in the NDCs as well. So yes, PACT is good, but uh, it's a first step. I'm afraid in terms of its scale and ambition, we still need to see a great deal more. And that, as I said, has a, an international legal context as well. So let's see if we can have Europe as a leader in public engagement. And that means engagement is not just a tag on, it's not just a, but it has to be built into policy from the very, very outset. We have to be thinking, will people support this? How do we build the mandate to support this kind of policy? Excellent. 30 seconds, Julia. Okay, well, I believe uh, that uh, survival is a collaborative project, that it's about, it's, it's a communal project, something to be done together. And I do believe we need a change of story into many sort of down-to-earth stories. And so I hope that the pact can uh, help us nourish these stories close to what people are actually doing and what people actually feel um, in, in their uh, um, local places, and and this is where I where I think um, uh, we need a lot of support so that uh, this um, uh, so that ecology becomes real, so that it becomes real, okay. it becomes a matter of practical life for as many people as possible. Thank you, Julian. Well. In 30 seconds, what I would say, I would emphasize the positive side of the climate communication. And uh, 
yes, we have a crisis, yes, we have uh, problems, but it opens huge opportunities for individuals across Europe and outside Europe as well. And we have to engage in not telling people the stories, but extracting that, these positive stories from people uh, from around Europe and not only from around the world. Thank you, Julian. And Lydia? Well, I think um, the important message here is that we can we can decide the approach um, in Brussels or Strasbourg or even in national capitals. Um, we politicians, we can set targets, set priorities, uh, but the impacts have to be handled on the ground uh, by the communities and all the people involved. And so this is the reason why communication is key to address each and every citizen participation on a scale and in a way that we have not generally done uh, such things before. Clara, your last word on the new town hall. <laughs> Thank you. Fighting climate change is, is hard, but it's worthwhile. So I invite everyone to come and join forces. United, we are stronger and then we, and use the pact to the, to, 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 for all of us to, to win this battle together. Next to United, we are stronger. Thank you to all our panelists today for an excellent discussion. There was a lot covered today and uh, some thought-provoking uh, remarks as well. Thank you so much uh, to each of you. Also, thank you to EIT Climate Kick for the support today and uh, to our team here, to Malta and to Teresa. If you want to continue to uh, with the conversation, go to hashtag EA uh, Debates and, uh, on your active and uh, you can uh, co continue to comment on our social media team. Uh, we'll engage with you there as well. So just to wish you all a very good evening. And thanks for participating today. I'm Brian McGuire.